Welcome back to this edition of the APSCC 2020 live webinar series. Uh, I'm Christopher Slaughter, your MC for the series. Uh, welcome to today's episode, Satellite Ground Segment Ready for the New Space Revolution. <laughs> Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by ST Engineering iDirect. We're very pleased to have their support uh, for this installment of the series and for APSCC overall. Uh, joining us today from EuroConsult is Stefan Chenard. He'll be moderating today's session, uh, which features the CTO of ST Engineering iDirect, uh, Frederick Simons. Simons. Pronunciation, not my strong suit, but uh, uh, he, he answers to his name. Um, <laughs> at any rate, uh, I'm going to leave you now and, uh, and let Stefan take over uh, with an introduction. And after that, Frederick's presentation. Thank you all very much for joining. And thank you, Christopher. Uh, greetings from Paris, France. Um, so usually the, um, the debate around new terminals for LEO satellites which is what we're going to talk about today. It's the grand segment for this new generation of multi-beam satellites that's, that's upcoming. Usually the debate turns around the RF equipment, the flat antennas with electronic steering and whether they will be ready or not, and what different models you can put on planes and boats and so on. Today, uh, Frederick, you're going to tell us about another part of the network, the other layer, the baseband, the banks of modems that in a teleport are hidden indoors behind the antennas. For the non-engineers, what happens at that level may be a little bit less easy to grasp than what an antenna does. And VPI Direct is coming up with uh, new approaches to um, that part of the network. Um, so, Frederick, why don't we um, why don't we pick this apart and uh, let's let's hear your story first of all, and then we will reconvene for a little bit of discussion after you're done with your presentation. It's all yours. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Stefan, for this uh, introduction. So indeed, we will be talking today about uh, the ground segment. And um, as you all know, there is a lot of things going on in our industry. So we call it here new space revolution. And that obviously has quite some impact on the ground segment in a sense that we also see a lot of need for innovation on the ground segment to enable uh, all of the uh, evolutions going on uh, in space, uh, but not only in space, um, also on the terrestrial side. Uh, and basically, this uh, picture here kind of uh, uh, shows the topics we're going to touch upon today. So we, we're going to make a point that uh, the ground segment is really at the center of uh, all the innovations that are going on. Uh, in space and on the and on the terrestrial side, I will show that uh, the ground segment is really uh, the enabler uh, of all of that. Um, so we have evolutions uh, in the space segment. We have evolutions towards uh, a new uh, ecosystem, which is really driven by uh, everything that happens around five G. And then there are some uh, what we call innovation enablers uh, that are kind of like industry trends that are not linked uh, to the space industry, but very, very uh, much beyond that, uh, specifically related to virtualization, standardization, and orchestration, where we can leverage a lot of the uh, evolutions uh, that, that need to take place uh, to enable uh, the innovation uh, in terrestrial side and space side, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll explain how that all uh, comes together in, in uh, the new ground uh, segment. So uh, let, let's kind of start with briefly introducing these uh, couple of topics. So the, the, the new uh, 5G ecosystem, um, as you all uh, are aware, kind of has, has kind of a context in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I'm sure you have heard about that term. Um, and what we see there is, um, in contrast to what the third industrial revolution was, where really all the innovation came from technology enhancements, we see that in this fourth industrial revolution, all the innovation comes from an increased uh, capability to, communi to communicate and to connect uh, the endpoints and the, the players uh, in that uh, fourth industrial revolution. And so we see there concepts, concepts like smart networks, 
uh, artificial intelligence and interconnecting uh, all kinds of systems. Uh, and that is really driving uh, what is going on uh, now. And um, you see that a convergence is taking place in all the access technologies um, and kind of the 5G uh, is the is the driver there of that convergence. So we see that 5G is kind of the, the single uh, technology that kind of enables all of the different uh, access technologies that are out there. And uh, the technology behind all of that is driven by uh, a, a trend in automation, virtualization, and orchestration. Um, and lastly, of course, um, the fact that the amount of endpoints really grows a lot. Uh, we see a need for scale uh, capacity enhancement, and then of course also a need for for more performance. So that's a bit what hap what happens on the on the five G terrestrial side. Um, similar uh, evolutions uh, are happening on the space side, where we where we see also. A lot of changes in the last couple of years. We, you, you all are aware, of course, that the entire space industry is moving from uh, traditional uh, geo satellites to more uh, G, uh, to more hybrid mix of uh, geo, meo, leo, and even heo uh, satellites, and also a move from HTS to very HTS uh, satellites, or very high throughput satellites, where um, not only the capacity is increasing a lot, uh, so uh, we're moving from gigabits type of capacity to really terabit level uh, capacities on, on a constellation level, but we're also seeing that the satellite capabilities uh, are changing a lot. Uh, a satellite used to be kind of made uh, to a specific purpose uh, with beams being designed to cover specific regions uh, with uh, beams being dimensioned in terms of bandwidth, in terms of megahertz, to provide specific uh, throughput uh, to specific regions. So all of that was, uh, in the past, pretty much pre-configured and was kind of designed at the moment uh, that the, the satellite is, is being manufactured. What we see now is that all those satellites become more and more flexible and the beams are no longer static, but they are completely dynamic in the sense that uh, the beams are being defined at the moment you need them and not at the moment the satellite is manufactured, which kind of, of course, opens a lot of possibilities and creates a lot of flexibility for, for, the, uh, for the operators of that satellite. Um, and we'll, we'll explain later on what kind of impact that has on, on their business. Um, and the last point, yeah, the, the fact that we're moving from on-demand payloads to more like standardized payloads nicely fits into that. So the, uh, the, the fact that you don't need to design uh, your satellite payloads up front, uh, but you can move more to generic payloads or standardized payloads, then uh, obviously creates some, uh, some uh, scale advantages um, that uh, generic payloads can be launched and then they are configured to the specific use case uh, long beyond uh, the launch. And so uh, this obviously uh, kind of takes away a lot of business risk uh, for uh, the operators uh, that are launching uh, those satellites. Um, of course, um, those innovations that are taking place on the terrestrial side, uh, the 5G evolutions, as well as on the space uh, segment side, have some implications uh, for the ground segment itself. And so um, you will see that the ground segment, uh, together uh, with the space segment, is moving away from uh, standalone networks. What I mean with that is that uh, typical VSAT systems have uh, always been kind of configured and installed uh, next to all kinds of other networks uh, that are out there. And what we see now is that this needs to blend in uh, seamlessly uh, with all kinds of other access technologies. So that's the first point that we're moving from standalone VSAT networks to more integrated ecosystems where the satellite connectivity is just 
one of the many ways to communicate in this 5G ecosystem. Uh, the second point is that um, the ground segment is really moving away from um, appliances. So basically that means delivering uh, separate uh, boxes to do the modulation, demodulation, processing to more a uh, virtual uh, infrastructure. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll zoom into what that means uh, later on. Um, and we also see that the ground segment is moving from a paradigm where um, everything is, is configured uh, up front to a more orchestrated service delivery, where basically uh, services and infrastructure is created and orchestrated at the moment uh, it is needed, and uh, nothing needs to be configured uh, when, when a satellite network is brought up. Uh, and that, of course, the, the last point is that uh, the satellite flexibility, and what I call here software-defined satellites, so satellites that uh, are really fully programmable, obviously translates to a need for a fully programmable ground segment to then ultimately create a complete software-defined uh, network. So these are kind of the consequences of the um, evolutions that are taking place in space uh, and on the terrestrial side, and uh, what that means uh, for, for the ground segment. So before we uh, zoom, into more detail into what all of this means. Uh, we're just gonna kick it off with an example uh, to set the scene um, and show how uh, a, future, uh, a future flow or a service order flow uh, would look like um, and how that differs from what uh, today's satellite networks uh, look like. So I'll just first uh, illustrate um, the satellite network and ground segment uh, that we are considering here. So there are different, different elements um, in, in a satellite system. Um, you see on the left-hand side, you see everything related uh, to the operator or gateway infrastructure. And on the right-hand side, you have the remote terminals. And obviously, you have the satellites in between there to connect a gateway uh, with remote terminals. And uh, the elements. Uh, of the gateway, uh, there are actually three main elements. You have uh, first the, uh, the platform NMS, so that ba basically the network management system that uh, is configuring and orchestrating uh, the whole gateway, but also the configuration uh, of the terminals. Then you have uh, the virtual core hub module and the virtual uh, baseband hub module which basically hosts uh, all the gateway processing functions uh, that manipulate uh, the, the, the data, the traffic, and that allow to send it uh, uh, over the air. So in the uh, virtual core hub module, you have, uh, which is typically hosted uh, in a data center and can be centralized for multiple uh, teleports, uh, basically hosting all the uh, traffic optimization functions like uh, compression, TCP acceleration, uh, routing. So that's all uh, being done typically at a central location. And then uh, close to the teleport, you will have uh, the baseband functions. So these are the traditional modulators and uh, demodulators. Uh, but there's a trend now to also fully virtualize that in a sense that you no longer have a dedicated modulator device or a dedicate, dedicated demodulator device uh, to perform certain modulation or demodulation functions. No, uh, instead of that, you have some uh, baseband hardware equipment. And as we will explain later on, depending on uh, the needs uh, or the need to create uh, certain uh, beams or carriers, we will spin up a virtual functions on there, and we call them here virtual baseband functions to then actually create those modulator and uh, demodulator functionality. Uh, and then, of course, on the right hand side, you have uh, your terminals. And then, also, one important uh, element that is becoming uh, more and more uh, standard, let's say, with those next generation satellite networks is 
some form of resource controller or global resource controller, which kind of manages uh, the configuration of the satellites and then also, of course, interfaces with the ground segment to synchronize the configuration of the satellites uh, with uh, the ground segment. segment. So satellites, as I have explained, become more and more flexible in the sense that beams and bandwidth per beam uh, can be configured on the fly. And it's the resource control that kind of programs that onto that satellite, onto those satellites, and also, then also makes sure that at the same uh, moment in time, the ground segment is also programmed to kind of light up the beams and the capacity that is being created on the satellite uh, to make sure that there is an end to end uh, connectivity. So these are the, uh, the elements uh, of the ground segment that are in play. And um, the example that we want to that we want to discuss here now is um, the, uh, the 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 example of a customer and a customer that can be a service operator or even a satellite operator that wants to to run a uh, carrier Ethernet service to a number of remote locations, and we'll show the the different steps that are being taken to enable such a service uh, on this new uh, ground segment. So uh, again, if uh, this is this is the space and ground segment uh, illustration, and what happens first to enable uh, such an uh, a new service is that the customers or the service operator or the satellite operator kind of uh, enters a new service order in in one of the uh, billing systems or uh, BSSs, OSSs that interface uh, with the platform NMS. And it also interface uh, with the resource controller. And so at that moment in time, that service order will be translated to uh, in an automatic fashion to a new satellite configuration and also uh, to a new um, uh, ground uh, configuration. So as you have seen at the moment that the satellite configuration um, is being entered, um, the satellites will be reprogrammed to uh, put the resources that are needed for that new service. In this case, creating uh, um, carrier Ethernet connectivity to a number of remote terminals on the right. You have seen that there is a, a yellow beam uh, being created as a result of uh, that new satellite configuration being uh, put uh, in, in the system. And at the same moment in time, uh, the ground segment is also spinning up the necessary resources to then eventually enable uh, the traffic uh, running uh, from the gateway to those new remote services. So what you see there is that uh, new uh, network functions and new baseband functions, so which are all virtualized, are being spun up uh, in the virtual core hub module and also in the virtual baseband hub module, and those. Uh, functions, so the VNFs and the VBFs, are then responsible for uh, moving the traffic from the gateway to the remote terminals and back, and so setting up uh, the end-to-end -end connectivity uh, between the gateway and the remote terminals. So just to come back or just to summarize what we have all seen here is that um, the satellite is being reprogrammed on the fly, so not up front, is being reprogrammed at the moment of uh, entering a new service order. And also the ground segment is being uh, created, or the resources at the ground segment are being created at the moment the new service order comes in. So there's not a lengthy process anymore of uh, installing new modulators or demodulators at the gateways. No, there's just uh, a bunch of uh, infrastructure available at the gateway, which uh, is dim dimensioned typically for a certain amount of gigabits of traffic. And irrespective of the amount of beams or the size of the beams, uh, that same uh, hardware can, uh, by, by simply adding those virtual network functions and those virtual baseband functions, can just uh, light up new beams and can create uh, new capacity uh, over satellite to uh, a set of remote terminals. So everything going fully automatic, no need uh, to bring in new hardware 
uh, the amount of resources that is there uh, is, is placed there up front and the resources uh, on that hardware infrastructure are being created uh, at the moment uh, they are needed in a fully automatic way. So this is um, kind of what this uh, ground segment orchestration uh, is all about. It's about activating beams and services on the fly. And uh, well, this slide kind of illustrates what is different in, in this paradigm compared to uh, what we had before. And uh, before activating a, a new service was typically a long and resource consuming process uh, because it typically involved adding dedicated hardware and configuring that hardware in a manual, ma in a manual uh, manner, uh, which then obviously translates in uh, more CAPEX, more OPEX, uh, less service innovation uh, because it's, it's less flexible. Uh, when you install the hardware, you typically already need to know exactly what you need to, what, what you uh, want to do with it. And uh, well, the, there was a, a tighter connect connection uh, between the service that you had uh, in your mind uh, and the hardware that you install um, uh, at the gateway. Uh, while now uh, activating the services happens fully automatic and also uh, can happen uh, at the moment that the new service is really needed. So uh, the operators are um, creating those virtual networks on generic infrastructure um, which obviously uh, is less prone to human error if this happens in a fully automatic way. So the, the service configuration triggers all the uh, ground segment uh, modifications or uh, infrastructure generation, uh, and this is no longer a manual process. Um, so that means that um, it, it creates uh, much lower risk and, and certainly a, a much faster time to revenues and uh, a lot more uh, flexibility over time bandwidth place, which means that uh, when you install your ground segment, you, you are not bound to a specific application or to a specific region or to a specific dimensioning of your network. No, uh, that happens at the moment you really deploy your services and you basically just automatically adjust uh, your ground segment infrastructure uh, to align with the services you want to run uh, on top of that on top of that uh, infrastructure. Um, so that is um, what the ground segment, or that is the role that the ground segment plays in that whole space transformation. It really is the inna uh, innovation enabler in a sense that um, the flexibility that the new space brings also translates into new flexibility uh, that is needed on the ground segments. So ground and space are much more uh, tightly interfacing uh, today than they were before. Um, so the orchestration, the flexibility that you see on space, you also find that back uh, in the ground segments. And uh, next to that, uh, it, it, it not only translates in, in more flexibility or more need for flexibility uh, on the ground, but it also uh, has a spin off in all kinds of new innovations that are needed uh, with respect to waveforms, for instance. Uh, so if, if the spacecraft or the, uh, the capacity that is provided in different beams can vary over time, it also, of course, means that the carriers that are being set uh, by the ground segment need to be able to, to change over time as well. So instead of having static carriers, there's a need for dynamic carriers, both in the forward and in the return link. So these are like secondary spin-offs of the fact that we need uh, more flexibility in the ground. Another example there is beam hopping, which is also a physical layer protocol that allows to uh, more dynamically uh, divide capacity over a larger amount of beams um, by hopping uh, the transmitted signals from one beam uh, to another in, in, a, in a round robin fashion. So the, the need for more flexibility not only translates to the way you are organizing uh, or setting up your infrastructure on the ground, it also translates to innovation uh, on the physical layer uh, protocols. 
Um, and then, as we explained in the example, there's, of course, also uh, an integration needed uh, between the ground and the global resource uh, manager. And typically, uh, there will be an API defined there that allows that the global resource manager that kind of reprograms the satellites to, at the same moment in time, also reprogram the ground segments to make sure that the ground segment is always in sync uh, with uh, the space segment. And all of that, of course, needs to happen in a fully automatic and uh, orchestrated manner. So there, need, uh, there cannot be any manual interaction there uh, when, when, uh, when, this whole, uh, when this whole flow of events, events uh, takes place. So obviously, that this brings a lot of benefits uh, for the end user. Uh, so we already talked about uh, the fact that it creates more reliability in the business models. Uh, the fact that you do you no longer need uh, to decide exactly what kind of markets or what kind of applications uh, you want to serve uh, at the moment of launch of the satellite or also at the moment of uh, ins installation uh, of the ground segment that is fully uh, fully transparent to that basically everything is configured or everything is orchestrated uh, at the moment, you are actually launching uh, those new services. So it's also adaptive uh, for different verticals. Um, this ground uh, segment needs to be uh, able to, to cover uh, all the verticals, and that's what, what the ground segment is able to do today, so that, uh, again, you are no longer bound to a specific vertical uh, when installing uh, this, this ground segment, but you can and depending on how uh, the market and the business evolves, you are able to just reuse that same infrastructure uh, for different uh, verticals. And then, of course, the last point is that um, you have this flexibility of time bandwidth place, meaning that uh, when you see more opportunities in one region uh, and more bandwidth is needed in, in that region compared to another, you are able to shift that bandwidth uh, not only uh, on the satellite, but also on the ground by just uh, reconfiguring uh, the hardware there. And by the way, also fully in a fully uh, automatic manner. So basically to enable the space transformation, the ground segment is going through a lot of innovation today uh, where we are moving uh, from static configuration to fully dynamic automated orchestration. Um, and not only uh, on the automation and orchestration side, but it also uh, uh, ripples through to the to the physical layer protocols and the and the high layer protocols that are being used uh, for the uh, for the communication between ground and space. Um, of course, um, there's there's this other trend that we talked about at the beginning is the fact that um, the satellite uh, system needs to become part of a much broader uh, ecosystem, uh, the 5G ecosystem, uh, which, which kind of puts some additional requirements to, uh, how, uh, to what the future uh, ground segment uh, needs to look like. Uh, so there are, of course, requirements in terms of scale, capacity, uh, means of, of communication, uh, uh, or means of, of, of kind of applications and traffic profiles. Uh, but, but the most important element is that uh, the ground segment needs to seamlessly uh, interface with all the standardization uh, that is going on in the terrestrial side. And so the standardization within 3GPP, uh, but also other uh, standardization bodies like uh, the Metro Ethernet Forum that kind of defines uh, the carrier Ethernet uh, protocols. Uh, the, the ground segment uh, for, for satellite communication should no longer be a, speci a special uh, way to do communication uh, to certain endpoints, but it should rather blend in seamlessly with all the other communication protocols that are in place, um, being uh, terrestrial broadband access or mobile communication. Satellite communication should just be one other means uh, to communicate within the 5G ecosystem and for, um, for terrestrial uh, operators or telco operators, satellite should no longer be a special case, but it rather should be managed and configured 
and authenticated and, author and authorized in a very similar way as all his other uh, terrestrial uh, communications uh, are being uh, are being managed. Uh, so um, to to show you what we mean with this, we we kind of uh, gonna gonna illustrate this by means of of two satellite communication use cases. And the first one uh, we call uh, the use of satellite communication for transport networks. And the second one we're going to call the use of satellite communications for access networks. Uh, so uh, as you can see at the bottom left uh, of this slide, satellites uh, can be used to connect nodes uh, in an overall network, uh, which can be located more in the core of the network. Uh, examples of that are like cellular backhaul, or connecting large enterprises uh, uh, with, with, with the internet backbone. Um, so that's the, that's the first uh, use case. And the second one is where satellite is really huge, used at, at the edge of the network to, uh, to provide like the connectivity uh, to, to, the, to the network endpoints. And examples there are like consumer broadband access, IoT, connected cars, and, and what we see is that in the terrestrial equivalent of that is that you typically uh, reside to uh, two different um, uh, protocol stacks uh, where uh, transport networks uh, are typically using uh, carrier ethernet type of uh, connectivity. Um, and then of course, the goal of the satellite uh, segment, uh, which is connecting them in this case, uh, nodes which are more in the in the center of the network, connecting core nodes and edge nodes. Um, and what we have there is that at the edges uh, of that satellite network, so both the terminal side as well as gateway side, uh, we need to align, uh, or the, the ground segment needs to align with uh, the control and data plane standards uh, that are in this case coming from uh, the MEF standardization, so the carrier Ethernet standardization, and the fact that there is a connection happening over satellite should be fully transparent uh, to the rest of the network. So at the edges of our satellite communication system, both at gateway and as terminal and at terminal site, we seamlessly integrate uh, with uh, the specifications of, of the MEF uh, carrier Ethernet standards, uh, so in terms of control plane and data plane, but also in terms of management and orchestration. Um, so as we, as we gave the example in the beginning, if a new service is being configured, uh, the same uh, service flows that would uh, configure the terrestrial network will now also be used to configure uh, the satellite network. So there's a full alignment here uh, between the satellite part and the, uh, the rest of the network part, let's say. Um, and the same uh, is happening for uh, the access part. So if satellite is being used as an access technology, then of course, uh, dominant technology there in the, on the terrestrial side is 5G. So again, uh, the, the satellite system will uh, at the edges, so both again at terminal side as well as at gateway side, will also fully interface uh, with with the 5G uh, protocols. Um, so th this way, um, operators like telco operators, they can just seamlessly blend in their satellite network in their entire uh, terrestrial ecosystem, and the satellite network is no longer a specific case, but you just configure it. Uh, exactly the same way as you are configuring your other uh, your other access networks, and also uh, the integration on the traffic and control plane level is also fully aligned uh, with uh, the other parts uh, of the access network. So that is basically what we mean with how the satellite uh, network or how the satellite system should integrate. Uh, with with the the terrestrial or uh, the five G uh, ecosystem. Uh, so uh, this slide kind of 
summarizes that. Uh, so the, there are a lot of uh, connectivity or types of connectivity uh, within, within the 5G ecosystem and satellite is just one of them. And depending on for what satellite is used, uh, it is configured uh, and it's dealt with in a completely transparent way uh, compared to uh, all the other uh, access and transport networks uh, that are out there. So um, that already brings me uh, to the last part uh, of, of this uh, presentation. Um, so we talked about uh, the evolutions on new space uh, and also on the terrestrial side on 5G and how that puts requirements and a need for innovation on the ground. Um, now we'll just briefly touch upon what are those innovation enablers that uh, we can benefit from uh, on the ground segment and that really allow uh, to bring that uh, uh, innovation um, by just uh, reusing a lot of the uh, technology evolutions that are taking place in, uh, in all the industries around there so that we don't need to need to reinvent uh, the wheel. Um, so we kind of see uh, several elements or several innovation enablers uh, that we are reusing in this new ground segment. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, on the left hand side, uh, we mentioned there the, uh, the, the standardization uh, that we can uh, fully leverage and the fact that uh, 5G is specifying um, how uh, those interfaces and, and how those protocols need to look like kind of is something that we can immediately uh, uh, rely upon and we don't need to uh, invent those protocols and those management and orchestration layers anymore ourselves, but we can just reuse fully what is being defined uh, on the terrestrial ecosystem. Um, and that brings us to the second point, like this orchestration framework and the way new services are being set up. Uh, that is something that we don't have to invent, uh, but we can reuse uh, concepts for, from like the, the Metro Ethernet Forum, uh, the life cycle service orchestration standardization that can be fully reused and leveraged uh, also for the ground segment. Of, obviously, all of this uh, drives upon the fact that the entire industry is moving to uh, full virtualization and leveraging uh, the cloud. Uh, so we're moving away from appliances to virtual network functions, and virtual network functions that can run on public clouds or private clouds, uh, but that have less and less uh, connectivity or less of less dependency on the specific hardware uh, those network functions uh, uh, are running. And then, of course, last but not least, there are a number of core technologies uh, that we have in-house, uh, like waveforms, cross-layer optimization, the way uh, satellite networks are being managed. And those core technologies, of course, are being adapted to actually bring those flexibilities that we have been talking about. For instance, on the waveform side, uh, we are uh, relying on dvbs 2 x but also the extensions uh, within the dvbs 2 x standard uh, that, for instance, allow for beam ho uh, hopping, or we kind of extend it ourselves to allow for uh, flexible carriers. Uh, and in the return link, we have our MXDMA technology that also brings that full uh, flexibility where carriers can be resized uh, on the fly uh, in a fully automatic and coordinated manner. Uh, so these are just some examples of how those core technologies that we have in our platform can be leveraged um, to fully bring uh, that flexibility that is needed uh, in the ground to enable uh, the flexibilities on the terrestrial side uh, and on the space uh, segment side. So this kind of, um, all these innovations you will find back uh, in the different elements uh, of our ground segment uh, and basically uh, with the goal to then deliver uh, that uh, fully automated, orchestrated and flexible ground segment platform that, uh, that interfaces with the terrestrial and uh, the new uh, space uh, segment. So uh, to conclude all of that, um, 
we see uh, a lot of things happening in our industry with respect to convergence of 5G and satellite communication and also uh, new space evolutions. And the answer to that is a ground segment that uh, fully adopts uh, the uh, automation and orchestration uh, that is uh, being standardized on the terrestrial side, uh, that delivers that flexibility in a completely seamless manner, so completely transparent uh, to the end users, that interfaces um, with a global resource manager that is uh, not only programming the space segment depending on uh, the new services that are needed, but also uh, programs uh, the ground segment uh, completely synchronized with that new space segment, uh, delivers that irrespective of the application, land, sea, air, uh, cellular backhaul, broadband access, and mobility, uh, that platform should allow uh, to be completely agnostic uh, from the uh, application that runs on top there. And then, of course, obviously, it delivers the efficiency, performance, and scale that is needed uh, to really uh, leverage all those new capabilities that are out there and also the new uh, scale and throughput uh, that is um, being enabled uh, by the evolutions uh, in the space segment. So that brings me uh, to the end uh, of my presentation, Stefan, and I'll hand it over back to you now uh, for uh, the Q&A. Thanks, Ulrich, and um, thanks again to all of you joining us. Uh, as a reminder, while we are having this discussion, you can uh, also uh, message your questions to Frederick via Slido, and uh, he will uh, respond via the same application uh, in text. So you we get two Frederick Simons for the price of one. If that's not virtualization in itself, um, let's. Um, uh, you, you, this, this is all about flexibility. Uh, you've hinted that today uh, satellite networks are not as flexible uh, as we would like them to be. Now, let's let's spend a minute on the way business is done today, just to put into into context and to, to contrast the uh, innovations that you have been uh, talking about. For 20 years, we've been we've grown used to the idea that it's all IP based, it's all bits. It doesn't matter what they are, and if I want at the same time uh, do a, a video conference uh, over a cloud application um, like we are doing now, um, exchange uh, plain text, uh, email, watch cap videos, get sound coming in, send files, PowerPoints in whatever format they are. It's all the same equipment. It goes through the same network. It's transparent to me, I don't have to know. Like we hear at every satellite conference, the end user does not want to know how his communications are handled, whether it's on satellite or terrestrial or through two cans with a piece of string. Apparently, not satellites are not quite there, right? And you've said, if I want to do a video conferencing between a ship in the Indian Ocean and Paris, I cannot just turn around and say, ah, okay, and now I want to connect um, a smart car uh, to another application or a sensor to, uh, to a server that at some point in a teleport, there's someone who has to scramble and say, oh, wait a minute, I have to configure the modem. Is that a fair summary of how business is done today? Or are we a little yeah. bit more flexible than that already? Well, Indeed, we are, uh, well, we're maybe a little bit more flexible than that in the sense that typically satellite networks today, they already have like central configuration. So you can configure uh, from yeah, what's typically called, typically called a NOC, a network operating center. You can configure modifications to your, uh, to your network. Yeah? So if you want to uh, create uh, a new uh, satellite network, uh, you can do that by means of configuration, uh, but that's still a bit different from where we want to end up here, is that when uh, a new service is being configured uh, across all the different technologies, uh, so basically the example that you give, if you want to uh, connect a ship uh, 
to uh, to some point in the internet, you know, you, you don't uh, you not only need to configure the satellite part, but also the the rest of the of the terrestrial network. And basically, what we what we're saying here is that the way the the rest of the terrestrial network is being configured should actually also be the way you configure uh, that satellite uh, segment. And so. Uh, there shouldn't be a, a satellite operator guy in the middle that in the in the network management system is entering new configuration. No, that should all flow automatically uh, from the service orders that that come in from the from the that the OSS, the BSS, the business systems that that configure uh, not only satellite part but also terrestrial part. And uh, those same uh, interfaces uh, should be applied on terrestrial and satellite part. And there's no need for a, a guy in the middle that kind of translates uh, the end-to-end the -end service into satellite-specific configuration. And that should all flow automatically. Uh, so the, the big difference compared to today is that there's no need anymore uh, for somebody uh, doing some configuration on the satellite part. Uh, it should all just uh, interface uh, in an automatic way and um, business uh, uh, service orders that are entered uh, in the in the end user service providers uh, billing system should eventually translate to a, a whole set of uh, configuration changes uh, on the satellite uh, on the satellite segment without any manual interaction. And no guy in the middle is very much the way that the terrestrial carriers have already been operated. Uh, since yeah. they went to IP, right? So the the the, the satellite <coughs> networks are catching up here. Yeah, and this uh, is of course, and this is of course to a certain extent also driven by the fact that uh, satellite systems were always a bit more static uh, than terrestrial systems, and because you you have those satellites with with fixed and specific configurations that they have certain beams, they cover certain regions, uh, but those beams uh, might not be where the actual traffic needs are, and so they should be able to be configured on the fly, which also means that the ground segment needs to be able to be configured on the fly. And uh, we also don't want any manual uh, guy there uh, in, in the middle kind of configuring both satellite segment and ground segment and keep them in sync. No, that also should happen fully automatic, uh, depending on the traffic needs or depending on uh, the service orders that are being placed. Exactly, and so this is this is a very much driven by these new uh, generation of satellites that are coming, for which there is no coverage map anymore. It's yeah, that, that this was the start of the discussion uh, on new satellites with satellite operators, show me your coverage. There is no such thing anymore because anything pretty much pole to pole any point uh, in the world can be covered um, at the parameters that, that you require. Now, those new satellites that are coming up, which include this, yes, um, uh, O3B and Power, uh, not the only ones, the Intelsat EPIX, where they were the forerunners, uh, the Viasat satellites, all of those footprints made of uh, tiny honeycombs of tiny little beings. Um, the user terminals and the user networks and the teleports as they are configured today, can they use those satellites or would, or would, it, would it just break down? Or would they have to invest in hundreds of thousands of modems to, con to cover every possible permutation? Um, so, um, well, the short answer, answer is that, of course, it can be used uh, over those satellites, uh, but to fully leverage all the flexibilities that those new satellites bring, uh, some innovation is needed uh, on, um, on, on the ground segment. Of course, the, the good part is that uh, the way we want to do this is to make sure that uh, people that have uh, an, a satellite uh, system today that they can simply or easily migrate uh, to, let's say, the future uh, satellite segment, so it doesn't have to be a forklift uh, upgrade. Um, so we're kind of bringing in uh, those uh, new innovations uh, with respect to uh, service orchestration and automation. We're bringing them in gradually, 
And we have the advantage that the installed uh, ground segments that are out there today are already virtualized uh, to a large extent. So it's basically uh, just creating an additional flexibility layer on top of the already, uh, uh, the already present uh, virtualization to kind of uh, allow more to uh, dynamically create and destroy uh, those virtual network functions and those virtual basement functions. So in short, there, there is uh, almost a full reuse of the install base, uh, but we're just talking here about, uh, about of the install based hardware, sorry. Uh, but we're talking about uh, just uh, creating new software releases on top there that will allow to, uh, to deliver uh, that automated flexibility uh, that is being uh, offered by, by those right. new uh, satellite yeah. concepts. That, that's an important point to make because it's one thing to change the to change the, the space segment. All you have to do, so to speak, is to launch additional satellites. That's it. It's a, it, an almost instant uh, change of infrastructure. Uh, but all of the um, legacy equipment, all of this um, capex, uh, all of those business arrangements with existing teleports do not have to be done to uh, avail of those of those new uh, capabilities. At the same time, looking at this from the market standpoint, so it's, it's almost infinite flexibility at our disposal. Not everybody needs infinite flexibility. Um, if my traffic stays contained within the same fixed number of beams, because my business doesn't move around that much, that's all. I, I manage, I have VSATs on top of 10 supermarkets and they are not moving around. Uh, I don't really need to change anything, right? It's your maritime, your aero users. We use through dozens of beams already. We will be first to benefit of this. And then, of course, there's not that many businesses that stay always within the same 500 kilometers. And as those beams become smaller, also, it's, it's a really small country that will be covered by only one or two beams of the satellites. How do you, how do you see this from, uh, how do your 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 end purchasers see this from the, the standpoint of how flexible their own businesses are. Yeah, so in, indeed, uh, some of the use cases or some of the customers have, have more need for this flexibility than others. Uh, but there are some, some commonalities, of course. Uh, so even if you have a relatively static uh, business in the sense of that uh, your uh, your traffic is known and which beams it will be, and you are really focusing on one specific application, you always still have uh, the fact that networks typically grow over time. Um, and so this technology also allows to, to, uh, to expand uh, your networks easily uh, and kind of take away the need that uh, if you just want to uh, add an additional 100 megahertz uh, of capacity to your network that you again have to install new modulators, new demodulators. Uh, so it's not in this case not about changing it multiple times a day the configuration of your network, uh, but still the expansion also happens a lot faster than it happens today. And so there's no need to to kind of schedule uh, weeks up front uh, uh, the next network expansion. No, it's just. Uh, triggering some, some configuration flows and all those uh, new uh, bandwidths uh, are, are made available uh, automatically. And then your traffic is known is a little bit an expression of the past also. Because just taking the example of this cloud-based video uh, session that we're having, who knows where the bits go through, how many data centers they touch before they complete what looks to us like a relatively simple point to multi-point um, uh, network, right? Uh, it's um, the more cloud-based, the more unpredictable the routing is. There's actually some other trends in the in the VSAT market as well. Uh, one is that the enterprise market is increasingly turning to VSAT for backup. And there you cannot predict where you will need the satellite link because you cannot predict which part of your network is going to fail. And when of the home. Yeah. And by and the way, the world also had long term commitments are not good business sense anymore. 
Yeah, correct. And uh, by the way, that's also uh, why you see uh, that this ground segment is being uh, uh, split up in different in different parts, uh, where you try to centralize uh, as much as possible uh, the processing um, to a central location, as so a central data center or so. Uh, and that at, at teleports, you typically want to want to minimize uh, the the equipment there uh, to also give more flexibility on where you want to link up uh, your services from. Uh, so switching from one teleport to another uh, is, is much more easy if the the equipment is is fully centralized and not placed at teleports. So that that also enables that indeed you don't need to know uh, where your 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 bits need to go uh, on which um, on which um, uh, teleport they need to land uh, this new way of organizing the ground segment uh, fully uh, fully allows for that this is maybe another useful point to make because all teleport operator friends are aware of this but the teleports make money out of hosting equipment and out of managing networks. And um, but this uh, this um, greater flexibility would make it easier to put those nodes in the network. It's not making them unnecessary. On the on the contrary, it makes it easier to bring them into a network. Yeah, indeed. So I th I think the, the the core business of those teleports is really to provide. Uh, the uplinks and the downlinks to the satellite uh, that's really where their core uh, their core added value is uh, and whether those network functions are, are really hosted at the teleport itself or at a more central location uh, i think uh, it only adds to the overall flexibility uh, the fact that that it's easier uh, to, to switch uh, from one teleport to another and by the way uh, by switching from one teleport uh, to another, it, it also means between, for instance, primary and backup sites. Uh, so that's also uh, an element at play here that uh, those services uh, have, have more and more stringent requirements on availability, but also means that you cannot always, that you can no longer rely uh, on a single up and down link uh, location, uh, but it must be possible to uh, to switch uh, in an easy way from one location to another, and that of course uh, becomes uh, uh, easier um, if um, if if the if the network functions and and the ground segment functions uh, are placed at the central location and not directly uh, at the teleports itself. Let, let's address the five G part of this because now this is a technology that could really put anything into the network, you can have in the same pipe a big video stream, data from smart cards, a million tiny bursts from IoT devices that are uh, measuring electric consumption or, or whatnot, and all will have to be routed and decoded in harmony. Today, would satellite networks run into problems if 5G were plugged into them? Well, run into problems, uh, and not so much, eh, because um, uh, I mean, some satellite networks are, like I explained in the in the in the presentation, um, are used for many purposes. And it can be used as a transport network to do backhauling, which is kind of like agnostic over about which traffic runs over there. Uh, but uh, they are not, uh, uh, let's say, fully integrated in the five G ecosystem. Eh? So the satellite links are still uh typically managed uh independently from all the other parts of the network and what we mean here with that integration is that uh for instance your billing system or your authentication system that you use for your terrestrial site should not be different than the one you use for your satellite uh, uh, segment site so uh, it's about aligning on the management configuration and control interfaces uh, that the satellite system offers and aligning that with those same interfaces of the rest of the terrestrial network so that uh, the, the higher layer management uh, business business systems and management systems 
can just configure and orchestrate those two parts in, in a very similar way. Uh, so a satellite is no longer specific or special case, it's just one of the many transport, transport or access technologies that you have in your terrestrial network. And so apart from a satellite network today being expected to use some specific protocols which you would which would become um, less siloed or unnecessary once we have this this level of, of homogeneity that uh, um, that you've described apart from that there's also the expectation that the traffic patterns have to be a little bit predictable whereas we're coming into a world where they might not be where they might be extremely bursty and that that would be more difficult. To, uh, to anticipate and to plan for. Um, there's a large community that BTI Direct is actually getting more and more interested in, uh, and that's been the, big, the key customers to satellites, that's the, the video broadcasters. I'm wondering if they still have some specificity um, that um, uh, specific needs that you have to take into account, or if they become also one more fish in the ocean for the networks? Uh, well, uh, I think you also mentioned it a few times uh, that the entire industry is also, of course, moving to uh, fully moving to IP. Uh, you have the, the OTT trend. Uh, so it, it, it is also converging, let's say, uh, uh, much more uh, to, the, to the other uh, services or the other markets that run on, on such a platform. Uh, there is typically, of course, the traffic profiles are 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 different uh, because there's typically a lot of lot, lot more mute, uh, multicast uh, type of uh, communication. Uh, although with uh, with the advent of the OTT, uh, this is also changing. So it it's it's becoming less and less specific, and it becomes uh, more and more easy. To integrate it in, in a, a single uh, single satellite communication system that uh, enables all types of IP connectivity and broadcast is, is just one of them. Well, absolutely, the, the broadcasters don't want to be treated differently. They want to be one more fish in the ocean because they, their customers have made clear that this is um, that this is how they want uh, their their service to be delivered. Now let's one one key parameter in the discussion on 5G. Every time it's uh, in the same sentence as satellites, it's always latency. That's uh, the fact that um, the signal when they when it goes through a satellite in geo incurs about 700 milliseconds of latency uh, makes that um, makes that communication look different to the terrestrial networks. And there, the um, the, de the debate on whether that's a definite problem for geos and they are doomed or no, it can be accommodated by spoofing uh, and whether some applications are more affected than others by this, a lot of that is resolved in the baseband at your level. What's your perspective and would those problems go away a little bit more irrespective of whether the satellites are geo or not because the, the geos will stay with us for quite, for quite a few more years. Uh, is that uh, mitigated to some extent by the fact that the networks uh, are more uh, become more flexible? Is it, is it does it become an easier problem to tackle, or maybe does the problem come to be with? Yeah, well, uh, well, latency is of course an uh, an, uh, an interesting topic by itself. Uh, so, um, well, there are a number of points. Uh, so, first of all. Uh, we uh, have a tradition in satellite communication industry to try to mitigate as much as possible uh, the impact or the effects uh, of latencies. And so we have all kinds of acceleration protocols built into our stack uh, so that, uh, for instance, if you do internet browsing or if you want to transfer large parts of, of data or high throughput data over satellite, that uh, you don't, uh, you're not hampered by TCP protocols that kind of go to a lower throughput or to a, a slower reaction time uh, because of the long latency of the satellite in between. Uh, so that is being dealt with uh, by traffic optimization technologies which are built in uh, into, our, into our systems. So that's one thing. Uh, 
but obviously, yeah, there are certain things, of course, that you cannot uh, compensate. Uh, so if you, for instance, want to have a very rapid uh, interaction, uh, just uh, one of the examples that is always used is the example of, of trading, uh, so it's automatic trading uh, algorithms that want a very rapid connection, for instance, between stock markets uh, in Europe and in the US. And uh, of course, uh, if you want to, if you want to create that connectivity over a geo link, uh, then yeah, you will always uh, encounter that latency, and you cannot compete to uh, connectivities uh, that don't have that latency. But that's then, of course, where where new satellite uh, constellations can come into play, uh, and and actually can become an advantage compared to terrestrial communications uh, between uh, because. Um, Connectivity from one side of the ocean to the other side of the ocean over a LEO network can actually be a lot faster than uh, doing that communication over transatlantic uh, fiber lines, for instance. So uh, I think satellite, the satellite industry there is also uh, evolving in the sense that it can even make latency uh, come to its advantage or, or can create a differentiator around latency. Uh, rather than than uh, a disadvantage, so I think the, it's a mixed story. So we uh, on on kind of traditional geo links, we have all kinds of mechanisms in place to to compensate for the effects of latency as much as possible. And where it's not possible, there are alternatives to geo. And then we're uh, coming more into the meo and the leo uh, area, uh, where um, yeah, where obviously those effects uh, are not in play. Okay, so it's a lot of exciting stuff to look forward to. Um, the satellite industry sometimes is is, made, is accused of being a little bit passive and, and not innovative enough and uh, still uh, sticking to, um, uh, to its guns. Not true, as we've seen. Uh, in some cases, it's probably ahead uh, of, the, uh, of the wave of innovation by the uh, terrestrial carriers and equipment vendors that define Things like the uh, the five G standards, um, and um, let's we'll see uh, how we get to play with this uh, infinite uh, flexibility that um, that you are delivering. We uh, this is about uh, the end of the R that uh, we wanted to use. I have no doubt that the uh, the questions are uh, raining on you through the the text application. Christopher, back to you. Stefan, thank you very much, uh, and and. Thank you very much, Frederick uh, Siemens from uh, ST Engineering iDirect, uh, the CTO of that company. Also, thank you very much to ST Engineering iDirect for support for this particular webinar. We're, we're very happy to, to have your support and your participation. Uh, thank all of you for joining us uh, for today's session. We look forward to having you, uh, having you with us again next week. Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you next week. Bye.